Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to take a few minutes while some folks pile in. Uh, there will be a poll uh, popping up. <laughs> Hopefully you have some fun with that. And uh, we're all uh, very excited to be here. Hopefully you can use your chat window if uh, you want to go ahead and give a shout out to the region that you're joining us from. That'd be great to see that. Um, you can also obviously use that for, for any questions. So um, yeah, the poll will be going for another minute or two and we'll give people another minute or two to go ahead and hop in. So again, feel free on, on the chat. Let's see where everybody's coming from and uh, we'll rock and roll in a couple minutes. Hey, Jill. Jill from Paso. Oh, yeah. Cool. Matt. Hi, Jill. Matt. We got some people from Oregon. A few people from Oregon. Sonoma, Napa, of course. Carol from Brave Vineyards. Hi, Carol. Up in Amador County. Love it. Nice. Hi, Meg. Mark Farmer from Dry Creek. It's been a minute. Good to see you. Hi, to Natalia in Texas. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good stuff. All right. Why don't we? Uh... Why don't we kick it off? Looks like we've got uh, about 100 uh, participants that have tuned in this morning. So um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Freund. I'm a managing director and the team lead for First Republic's uh, wine practice here in Napa. And on behalf of Community Benchmark, uh, the Wise Academy and First Republic, we'd like to thank you for joining us for what we believe will be a very educational and entertaining presentation on some of the key DTC trends that we're seeing in the wine industry and in, uh, in this very unusual and challenging year of 2020. Uh, the genesis of today's presentation really started about a year and year and a half ago when I was introduced to one of our panelists and the founder of Community Benchmark, John Kelleher, who you've already heard from and his colleague, Nick Rood, who's also uh, on, the, on the panel with us this morning. Um, and at that time, I learned about how they were working with wineries to provide real-time meaningful data to help uh, businesses measure and compare their key DTC metrics and determine areas that needed uh, uh, improvement or uh, needed addressing based on that data. Uh, our other panelist today is Leslie Berglund. Uh, Leslie is the chairman and founder of the WISE Academy. And if you're a winery owner or operator and you've analyzed your data and you've identified some areas in your DTC efforts that need fine tuning, oftentimes you and your staff need help to make those improvements. And that's where Leslie and her team really come in. Uh, so our agenda for this morning is to present some of the key trends that we're seeing. Uh, John and Leslie are gonna take us through some of the key findings from Community Benchmarks data and discuss the whys behind the numbers, so not just the data. Uh, and then Leslie is going to take us through some best practices that you can consider for your wineries as we move into 2021. We're also going to throw a few polls, which we've already had the first one up, uh, just to make sure that you're paying attention and uh, not catching up <laughs> on emails uh, during the webinar. And lastly, we'll leave about 10 to 15 minutes for some Q&A. So uh, please use the Q&A button to submit your questions and we'll accumulate those and, and try to get through them all during the Q&A session. Um, and then there's also a chat feature, uh, and Nick, I think, is going to be uh, looking uh, at the chat comments as they come in and trying to address those as we, uh, as we move along. So I've already given you a, a little bit of a sneak preview in terms of how Community Benchmark and WISE work with wineries. So I'm going to turn things over to John and Leslie now to share a little bit more about their companies, and then we'll dive right into the presentation. So Leslie, why don't you kick it off? Great. Thank you so much for, for having us. 
I'm, as Mark mentioned, my name is Leslie Berglund and at WISE, we are really uh, excited to have been long-term supporters of, of um, First Republic Bank, of course, and also working with community benchmarks. And so for those of you who've worked with WISE and worked with me personally, you know I love data. And so what we're gonna be doing today is John will show some of the numbers and I'll show, help share what we're seeing with our WISE wineries of background color that brings those numbers to life. So thank you for having me, John. Cool, thank you, Leslie, and thank you, Mark. Uh, super excited to be here. Uh, community benchmark for the Unwashed, uh, just kidding, is a platform to help everyone, wineries, find their best growth opportunities and better understand their numbers by comparing with their peers anonymously, of course. So our members get a series of monthly reports, uh, an online dashboard, um, and, and through those, they get a better idea of what to focus on. And just, just a quick note on that, you know, there's a lot of... Um, say anecdotal information out there. I also heard a recent term, Anna data. Uh, but basically the point is, is that you, you, know, you can talk to your friends and you can, and you can talk to the neighbors, um, but I would highly recommend let's stick with the facts because uh, at the end of every month when we release our report, all of our members get a few uh, fun surprises. Uh, not, all, not all positive in strengths, but of course, if it's not a strength, then it's a growth opportunity, right? So. Uh, with that being said, let's hop right in. So uh, first of all, I just want to describe the data set for a quick second. So we have over a couple hundred wineries in the Northern California region, also sent down in the Central Coast, just launched in Washington, uh, so a few there as well. Oregon, I know we have uh, several folks joining us from Oregon. I'm sorry, we were planning to launch in May of this year until the thing happened, so we're on our way. Uh, nonetheless, I think a very good, healthy data set to understand what is happening. Um, and so what I will show you is number one, visitation down by almost half. Now, just to be clear, if you add up all the visitors from all of our wineries this year, and compare it to all the visitors to all of all of our wineries last year, year to date through October, that's a 48% difference. And the amazing part is that total D to C sales are only down 1.8%. And I'm gonna go ahead and round that up to flat, hence the gray neutral donut there. But I think that in a sense, this would really be uh, the headline of 2020. I'll leave the headlines to our partners at, at Wine Business Monthly to do a much better job than us and have some great data sets. But I think the headline might be something like visitation cut in half, D to C remains the same. However, how we got there is the question, right? So how, I mean, who would have thunk it if I would have said at the beginning of the year, hey, we're going to cut your visitation in half and you're going to maintain uh, your D2C sales overall. Uh, and also uh, you can see the total is down 1.8%. The results of the poll just came in and you can see that uh, about half of our members today are above, um, about 28% below and 23 about the same. That is a almost exact match to our, our data set. When you look at the wineries, there are, the majority of our wineries are actually up up a little bit. Um, so anyway, that being said, again, the question is, how did we do this? And that's why we're going to go over 2020 by the numbers. We've got three, what we call more with less D to C sales trends. And again, all the data that we're going to show you is year to date through October, 2020. Any questions, etc., please fire away in the chat window uh, or, or keep them to the end, your choice. And that being said, so the first trend, again, starts with the tasting room. Obviously, visitation being down, as I said, almost cut in half. But the key, key performance indicators of the tasting room are all up. And so conversion to purchase, purchase conversion, this is the number of visitors that are actually buying wine has gone up 4%. It was 57% last year. Now it's 61 
Uh, club conversion is up to 5.9 from about four and a half last year. And the average sale is obviously up as well. And just so you know, you know, average sale is obviously very dependent on bottle price. And I will say that as far as bottles sold in the tasting room, this year we're selling at an average of about 2.6 to 3.1 bottles in that bandwidth, which is about a half a bottle increase over the same time period last year. So again, little benchmark for everyone. Are you selling at least two bottles, uh, sometimes three in your tasting room? And so this is essentially why tasting room sales are down, but not nearly as much as visitation. Tasting room sales are down 39%. And it's because the performance indicators are up. So um, Leslie, I think a lot of this stuff is also highly dependent on uh, the amount of visitors you're seeing, the, the type of experience, et cetera, right? things we've seen. We early in the season of COVID, well, actually it was probably in May, we were asked by a number of trade associations in wine regions across the company, country to help wineries with the reopening process as they started doing so. And so from the end of May, really into September, we had conversations with 17 wine regions and hundreds of people about what was going on in the process. And here's what we've heard. First of all, because there are gifts of COVID. Uh, I know it seems hard to believe, but they're, they're showing up here in these numbers. First of all, the majority, if not all wineries have now gone to reservation only. For many wineries that was on their list of things to do, they wanted to do it for a long time, but didn't pull the trigger and reopening under COVID, of course, forced them to do so which is great because that means the, the visitors who are coming are there with intent and with purpose. So that's one trend that's showing up in better conversion rates and average order values. Also what's happening is uh, for obvious reasons where you don't have the um, belly up to the tasting bar. You know, instead we have seated private experiences and we've known for many, many years through the Wine Business Monthly annual data that the conversion rates and average order values vary dramatically by the type of guest experience. So now we're seated in private, we're being safe from COVID, we're being safe when it comes to um, COVID practices, and that's resulting in a better guest experience, higher conversion rate, higher average order value. Now it does take more people to pull that off. So our labor has definitely gone up, but for most wineries, it is more than worth it because of the um, financial upside. Awesome. Thanks, Leslie. So um, with that, I'd like to take us into a quick little visitation sidebar. Okay. So allow me to reminisce for just one second to January and February. Remember pre-COVID, so what, by the way, what we're looking at here, the light green bar is last year's average visitation. The dark green bar is this year's visitation. So we're pitting 2019 average visitors against 2020 across all, again, all of our, our wineries. And yeah, January and February was started off so great. We were up visitors 13, 14, 15%. And then of course you see March getting cut in half, April, May, June is when it starts to come back a little bit. And we can see that basically uh, all the way through October, it looks like the visitation is starting to trickle back in a bit down only 30% in October, classically the most visited uh, month compared to uh, before. And so then the other thing that I would just like to say is that as we all know, visitation is highly regional dependent. And we have certainly noticed that regions that have stronger local traffic, i.e. less dependence or attraction of national, international traffic are doing much better than those that, that are. So for example, in Napa, we're actually seeing visitation down quite a bit more. I think their average on the year is in the upper 50s, trending towards 60. And I think that's Sonoma as well. Whereas you look at regions like the Central Coast, where traffic is a little bit more drivable up from LA, even over inland in Amador County, very local traffic. Those wineries are 
almost back to 2019 visitor levels uh, um, in October. So just an interesting visitation sidebar, sidebar there. Let's get back to business and go to trend number two. So um, basically our, our second more with less trend is more club sales with fewer club members. And I would like to dig in really quickly into this benchmark here, uh, the net growth rate. Okay, that is basically saying that is your club 1.3% smaller than it was at the beginning of this year, January 1st. So for example, if I had a thousand member club, I'm now 987. And just because 1.3%, you know, it's 1.3%, but just so you know, this time last year, clubs had grown almost four and a half percent. So, you know, it, with other words, you could say we're 6% behind where we could have been. And digging into that, I just want to say that interestingly enough, what underpins the club member decline is our, our lack of signing up club members. Obviously the traditional tasting room is our primary, has been our primary um, acquisition channel for new club members. Um, but I just want to show you that, again, the problem we're seeing is primarily with we're not replenishing the club member database, right? Uh, so it's not retention. You can see attrition is down. That's good. And just to walk through this benchmark for everyone, you know, 20. So last year, 24 percent acquisition rate. What that means is that, again, going back to that thousand member club, that would mean that through October, we would have acquired 240 new club signups. Whereas this year, that 240 is down to 160. So hope that's, hope that's clear as a, as a benchmark, but we're gonna get more into that later. Um, I think the other thing I wanna show right here is, where's that 16% club sales growth coming from? And you can see here, here's the breakdown year to date across all the wineries that essentially on the left, you've got 69% of club sales coming from your regularly scheduled club shipments. And on the right, you've got the 31% dark green, which is beyond shipment. This is every dollar your club members spend with you outside of their normal uh, club shipments. And so this is, you know, through uh, phone calls and emails, tasting room included, et cetera. That's where the growth is. Okay. You can see there that um, the majority of the growth in club sales is coming from engaging your club members outside of the normal club shipments. Most of the growth in, if not all of the growth in the club shipment channel itself is simply an increase in revenue per shipment. So, um, Leslie, what does that bring up for you? Yeah, so what we're seeing, and again, the feedback is coming from the community forums we've run across the country, as well as every month we have a group of 150 wine industry leaders that we meet with in smaller groups we called our WISE Cabinet Program, Leadership Forums for the Industry. What, we're, what we see through this process and, and the tales that we've heard is exactly what's coming out on this. This is probably one of my favorite slides in here. Is, okay, obviously the club membership is shrinking because we don't have the tasting room traffic and we historically have been over dependent on, and only dependent, many wineries, on tasting room to sign up new club members. So we haven't, even though we have a higher conversion rate of the club member signups in the tasting room, it's not enough to make up for the decrease in traffic. But what else is happening? Well, first of all, I know many wineries we worked with at the early in the season of COVID imme immediately redid our forecasts and said, okay, we've been through challenges before 2001, 2008. We know one of the first thing that happens when disaster hits, previous ones had been economic, um, is that the attrition rate uh, goes up dramatically. And so a lot of wineries re-forecast and we're preparing for the worst and it just didn't happen. As a matter of fact, um, our club members are even more lo loyal. As many of you know, uh, the club members are the first ones to step up early in the season of COVID and answer our phone calls and be extra responsive to emails. And when we opened our doors, they were the first ones back through. And so they are more sticky than we thought, which is fantastic. So, but where does that 16% growth 
come from? First of all is, hmm, even with the shipments, that 69% of the auto shipments, that grew, it's a big base, and that grew 6%. So what's going on there? Because we, we have fewer members. Well, this is showing the importance of club customization. With most wineries, you know, many wineries were doing it for years, but technology finally caught up to it. And most wineries are doing customized shipments now. There's the default base shipment, but they give uh, members the opportunity to swap out some wines and net net more wine is sold through auto shipments. So it has saved our bacon during this time for sure. Uh, but the second part, which is really exciting, is that beyond club beyond the auto shipments, our club members are 48% increase in club activity and engagement beyond the auto shipment. So again, it's phone, it's web, and it's virtual and it's virtual tastings, which is really exciting. And one of the and um, you know, another gift of COVID, like they were always loyal, but now we test, we stress tested it. Yep. And I would say uh, as another testament to that is that uh, the percent of visitation coming from club members is up quite a bit. You know, the average used to be somewhere around 20% of your visitation was uh, club members. And now it's definitely itching, inching up to 30%. So um, I, I think, you're right, Leslie, this is a really great side. It really underpins what's driving a lot. And so we're gonna come back to this in a moment. But before that, I would like to go ahead and go to trend number three of more with less. Well, sneak peek there, did anyone catch it? <laughs> can, you, uh, can, can you guess? So we've talked tasting room, we've talked club. And now we're gonna go to the interwebs. And what we're looking at is the D to C split year to date across all of our wineries through October. So first of all, I'm just going to describe what we're looking at here. So I hope that the black and blue are um, easy to understand. Those are the traditional channels. We've created a digital plus channel that basically includes everything that you are selling outside of your traditional club shipments and tasting room. And so this is your email marketing, your phone calls, your, you know, uh, your online uh, virtual experiences are wrapped in there. And just so you know, that 27% that you see on the right in 2020, that is roughly split evenly actually between what's happening on the phones versus what's happening on the web. And I think the more important thing to notice is that it's double, almost double, we went from 14% of the pie to 27% of the pie. So it's almost double. And I think the other thing that's fascinating is that it's now more important than tasting room itself. Um, I will mention, just in case you're wondering, that other channel is simply miscellaneous revenue that uh, doesn't quite fit into any of these other three categories. For example, corporate gifting or house rentals. It's as you can see, it's 2% and relatively in, immaterial. So um, anyway, that being said, I think, you know, if you look at the growth numbers here, you could see why the shift in the pie. Um, I did not plan that rhyme, I promise. But um, what we can see here is that the Digital Plus channel has grown 80% year to date through October, while tasting room sales, as I mentioned before, are down 39%, uh, which of course is not as much as visitation, and that's because of the key performance indicators being up. So that's, uh, that's the Digital Plus story. And again, Digital Plus, every dollar that you're generating uh, basically over the wires, right? So virtual experiences, online phone, et cetera. Um, Leslie? Yeah, so let's unpack the Digital, <laughs> the digital Plus bucket, if you, if you will. So obviously, web sales have exploded. And it was really interesting. I was on another, uh, another panel discussion about a month, month or two ago, and someone was saying, oh, finally, wineries are getting around to doing digital. No, wineries have been doing digital for a long time. It's finally the consumer has really wrapped their arms around and engaged in the channel. They're being more responsive to our emails, which is fantastic. I know I personally, as many of you have probably changed how I buy 
everything during the season of COVID. And that's not gonna change once we get back to uh, whatever the next normal looks like. So the consumer has shifted, digital has exploded, and that's great. The second thing that's happened, and I know many of you have done this, is uh, dialing for dollars, is picking up the phone, checking our club members, seeing how they're doing, and actually being proactive. Now, this is a channel that has been around for a long, long time. This is not something new. Some wineries before COVID knew of the power of phone and had consistent phone activities, but many wineries had just not really gotten there yet out of desperation or fear or whatever. They picked up the phone and started calling and guess what, it worked. And so that has absolutely exploded as well. The third segment within Digital Plus, and they really are three separate channels, we're just putting it into one data bucket, is the virtual experiences, virtual tastings, virtual events, get to more of that in, in a little bit. But the interesting thing of what we've noticed with the, with the wise wineries that we look at is they kind of are, have been working with is that in general, wineries have fallen into three categories. Uh, COVID hit and some of them just kind of battened down the hatches and furloughed everybody and waited for the tasting rooms to open again. Some leaned in hard to phone and the virtual, but then when the tasting rooms opened again, they redeployed back and just focused on the tasting rooms. And the third category of wineries who've said, okay, we've reopened the tasting rooms, but we now know how important all of these activities within Digital Plus, and we're gonna find a way to keep doing it all. And those are the ones that are killing it <laughs> uh, during this time. And I would also say that when you look at the top 20% of our uh, Digital Plus performers, this donut shifts to that green slice being actually uh, in the upper 30s. So somewhere around, I think 35, 36% is what the top 20% uh, of our members uh, donut looks like, just, just so you know. So great, thanks Leslie. Let's go ahead and hop into some key findings for 2021. Um, hope you guys are all warmed up because uh, we've got a couple pretty slides coming up. You know, I think uh, one of the central questions is how much digital should we plan for, right? So um, there's a poll, just so you all know, uh, coming up, uh, are you planning or forecasting more sales in your tasting room or through your digital channels uh, in, in 2021? It'll be interesting to see the results on that. And it just so happens that's a very appropriate question because what I'm gonna look at right now is that same, so we just looked at the year-to-date October pie, 27% uh, overall. Let's take a look at that on a monthly basis. Okay, so same channels, same color scheme. And I think what I really wanted to show here, again, towards 2021 planning, how much digital should we be planning for? Well, um, if you remember back to the visitation slide, when did that start to come back? And you can kind of see it in the, go ahead, Leslie. Well, yeah, you can see it right here. It starts to come back a little bit in June. Yeah, so so starts to come back a little bit in June, and and if you look at basically those months from say July through October, I'm going to go ahead and put the percentages up here. You can basically see that obviously um, the digital channel in green is clocking in a little bit above 40 percent of D to C. And in every month, even in October, it's still equal to the Tasting Room channel, which is, again, surprising given that taste, uh, October is our most heavily visited month. So if you take those four months and put them all together, you're looking at a 52 to 48 split from Digital Plus to Tasting Room. Hopefully that's helpful in you looking forward and thinking about what is um, uh, what wh what to plan for, right? So, and then finally, I'll give you the projected pie or donut, sorry, for 2020. Uh, looking at finishing, obviously, November is also a big club shipment month. December is one of the historically biggest digital months, and so basically, that's why you can see the tasting room pie shrinks even further 
uh, down to 17%. I've got one comment here, John. I think that where I said there was the three buckets of how wineries have reacted during the season of, of COVID, that, that middle bucket, which was, okay, we're focusing, we're redeploying our team, we're getting them on the phone, we're focusing on virtual, whoops, tasting rooms open again. And so we're gonna go back and just focus on tasting room. They're not finding ways um, to do both. And, uh, and so that is, and we just see this now on the poll results coming back, people saying they're <laughs> leaning into more on the 70% growth rate on it. We find, have to find a way to not drop one to do the other. Um, but find a way to actually um, put the appropriate level of resources against web, phone, and virtual. Great. And so just to double click into this light green bar in terms of where the Digital Plus is coming from, let's do that. And what we're looking at is the percentage of Digital Plus coming from members versus non-members on a monthly basis. So the dark green Basically, for example, if you look at October, almost 75% of Digital Plus came from club members. Obviously, a heavy club shipment month, uh, and so that makes sense. But if I were, again, if I were to look at the year-to-date donut of how much Digital Plus revenue is coming from members, it's almost 60%. So uh, again, another benchmark for everyone in, in, to Leslie's point in terms of how are we going to achieve uh, the 70% the, the of you who are planning on more digital revenue, how are we going to achieve it? Well, it, this slide just really, I put it in here to speak to the importance of uh, the club membership and replenishing our base. I also view this slide as kind of a myth buster. In essence, pre-COVID, there was too many wineries that really kind of viewed their club members as we're doing our auto shipments. Yes, there's some customization, but that's our engagement with them. And they weren't really viewing them as, this, as a source for additional revenue, which you know we've, we've seen during this season is absolutely true. Great, yeah, we've talked to definitely some wineries that um, are, interested and concerned about um, how to engage with their club members online. And this just really shows you uh, the importance of it. And so what it goes back to is this Leslie's favorite slide here. Uh, if you remember back to the acquisition rate that we spoke about, I'm gonna zoom in on that for a quick second. So again, um, acquisition rate, if we had a thousand members at the beginning of the year, uh, in 2019, the 24% mean, meant that we had signed up 240 club members through October. Obviously, this year, that number is 160. On the right there, you see projected numbers moving current trends forward. Basically, the benchmark for everyone um, is, is, is there for all of our wineries. But as we move into Leslie's best practices, I wanted to share with folks uh, a good a good peek into what we do. So we're going to show some segmented benchmarks here. Obviously, acquisition rate when you're dividing your new signups by your size of club, that is very dependent on size of club. So when you look here in this table, uh, you'll see acquisition rate 2019, 2020 by size of club. So again, for example, if you have a thousand member club. Uh, basically, and again, these are end of year numbers. So basically, if you have a thousand member club, you'd signed up 270 members by the end of 2019. This year, it's 210 projected, of course. So, you know, the question is, uh, you know, how do we get back to uh, the benchmarks that we had in the previous year, given uh, the visitation situation? And so I wanted to really mention that to everyone because we're seeing all this digital growth and the majority of it is coming from club members. So let's just not take our eye off the ball in replenishing that um, a bucket so that we can actually move the needle forward in growing our club membership um, as opposed to sort of staying sags on the wrong side, wrong side of stagnant. 
So Leslie looked like she froze a little bit there. Nope, you're still here. <laughs> Any, <laughs> okay. I'm happy to leave these up and just, you know, we're, um, we'll, we'll send everyone a link uh, at the, at the end of this, um, at the, the last slide has a link to it so that, you know, you can uh, download the deck if you like, uh, and also, if, you know, ask us more questions and that sort of thing. But at this point, I think Leslie is going to bring us home with some of what she's seen from those there's, hundreds and thousands of wineries she's talking there's about. There's a couple questions that have come up in chat that I actually think we should get to now, John. Um, okay. one, one is, can you speak to the volume of wineries pulled for this data? So how many are in this data set? A little over 200. Okay. Thanks. And then there was another question that came through Q&A, which was, we've just shown the Digital Plus numbers, which has three buckets. What uh, do you have the data on web only? Yes, so that digital plus bucket is done about, uh, so it was, it's 27% year to date, it's 14% web only. Okay. Uh, sorry, maybe that was confusing. 27% yeah. uh, is the digital bucket, half of that digital bucket is done online, half on the phone. And what, so, and what growth are you seeing on the web side? Uh, the, 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 that's a very good question. So the web growth is closer to about 100% and the phone growth is closer to about 60, 70%. And that's how you end up with that 80% digital growth. So one challenge in that data, one of the reasons we're talking about it in a big digital plus bucket, even though we certainly have the channel details behind the scenes, is because most wineries so far are not breaking out their virtual experiences into a separate bucket. And sometimes it's showing up in web, sometimes it's showing up in phone, <laughs> sometimes it is in a separate bucket. I think our 2021 goal for the industry is, uh, is the virtual channel is here to stay. It's the sixth channel of Consumer Direct. We've witnessed its birth during COVID and we wanna make sure that we're measuring that um, separately so we can really see what's happening. Cool, thank you, Leslie. And so, I did just put in, oh, sorry, excuse me. Um, so I just, did just include the link to request the slide deck in the chat. So again, as John mentioned, we'll come up at the end of the presentation, but if you're eager to make the request now, you can click on the link, copy paste, it's there for you. All right, thanks, Peter. Well, don't, don't uh, pile out yet. Leslie's going to drop some gems on us here when we go and look at essentially what she has seen and what she recommends with these topics right here. Right. So just after reviewing the data and having conversations with John and Nick and, and Mark over the last week or so, the things that jumped out at me, and uh, we just want to take a couple, a couple moments, is consider these wise bites, if you will. First of all, let's go back to the tasting room. We know, okay, we've got a traffic issue. I think one of the key things here is because we are now seated private experiences, we are seeing some wineries that have really, embra em really embraced this. Now they've had to shift the, literally the new guest journey map and the choreography kind of where PPE meets hospitality and get their team members comfortable with that. So wineries who have shifted successfully to the table service and still treat it as a way that they can engage with the customers and not just drop the wine and dash. We saw that early in the reopening, um, but really use it as a way to have a more intimate experience yet still be safe are exploding. So leaning into this gift we've been given, which is we now finally have the private seated experiences we've always wanted, uh, let's do it really right. So that's the first one, semi-obvious. The second thing that is a byproduct from what we've gone through and others, uh, and others before COVID have said, hey, we're too dependent upon the tasting room. Well, we've proven that to ourselves. In general, our direct to consumer programs, our wine club membership growth cannot be as dependent as it has been in the past. And so we have to find ways to decrease the dependency on the tasting room. I'm not saying don't do tasting room and when it's open and when we can 
be outdoors and be safe. And that's awesome, but we can't have all of our eggs in one basket. And so actively working to not um, to decrease our dependency on the tasting room is really strategically important. And how can we do that? This gets into those three buckets of how wineries have behaved so far in COVID is we need to proactively develop what we at WISE called utility players. These are team players who can do a tasting room and they're great tasting room hosts. And if we have downtime or have to close again, or not even downtime, part of their jobs can be on the phone dialing for dollars and also getting their skills and confidence up around virtual. So we believe that developing a team of utility players, not all people are going to lean into all channels, but the more we can do that, the more resilient we will be um, with our organizations. And so as you're thinking about 2021 strategies, what are you proactively doing to make sure that our team members are not uh, only stuck in one channel. If they have more skill sets, they will be more valuable to you in growing the business. The other thing with the wine, uh, on the wine club side, we saw, uh, we saw that, okay, wait a minute, membership's down, but, but revenue is up. And we showed you the overall averages for the 200 plus wineries in this data set, but it is critically important to really know what's happening in your numbers because everyone's different. And how you can best serve your wine club members in the future are already buried in your data. You just need to unpack it. And so really understanding it and breaking it out by club level is critical. And using that level of forecasting, don't just forecast the top line growth, you gotta build it from the bottom up saying, okay, Here's the number of club members on a percentage conversion rate we've gotten from the tasting room. Now we're getting more club, wine club members signing up online. Some of you, and I hope more of you are getting more wine club members signed up via phone and via virtual experiences. So building bottoms up forecasting has never been more important um, than it is this year. Also, we've gotten lucky so far in terms of the attrition rates coming in way better than we thought, okay? Now, we've had a lot of governmental support, you know, with the economy and that may or may not hold going forward. I know that many of our wineries are being conservative in assuming that eh, if recession, you know, hits or accelerates that actually we might not be so lucky in having, um, we might take a hit on the attrition. So that gives even more need to find additional sources for new club signups. We saw in these numbers that actually having proactive campaigns beyond the auto club shipments for our club members, they're doing it anyway. What if we were trying? <laughs> so, you know, really measuring the business and going through uh, your club member programs to make sure that you've got all campaigns, that you're extending club member benefits. Uh, for virtual, et cetera, and looking at club members by segment, not by the channel of how they're buying is really important. And then the third lever within club is how can we, we call it flip the funnel. How can we take those, the, the peak of our best customers and use the, and basically use that relationship as a jumping off point to meet, to meet new customers. And one of the most explosive things that's happening is for wineries who are doing virtual tastings with their club members. And then the club members are bringing their extended family and friends. And that finally is opening up the door to um, signing up new club members that are not dependent upon the tasting room. So kind of using that as the domino effect and doing specific programming around it is the wineries who are focusing there are not missing the tasting room volume and they are no longer dependent upon the tasting room. That does not mean they don't do the tasting room well, of course they do, they're just no longer dependent upon it. Three comments specifically within Digital Plus and I could of course go, go on and on um, is 
uh, on the website, yes, as I mentioned, the consumer finally came and many wineries are, are seeing explosive growth in that area. So if you had been putting off any upgrades to your websites or investment spending, now's the time to do it because your payback is going to be pretty quick. Also, what we're seeing in this redeploying of tasting room team members, any, no such thing as downtime before if you have live chat on your website, you know, getting, again, cross-training, getting those team members uh, to help support web sales, that has been very successful for the wineries who have used it. On the phone, before COVID, some of you knew the power and profitability of phone as a sales channel, inbound and specifically outbound. Um, and what we've seen is kind of proof of concept for the rest of you who didn't believe it and tried it during early stages of COVID is a proactive ongoing phone program absolutely pays off. Again, you can't cross train all of your team members. Some won't go for it, but way more do and are successful than what wineries originally thought. So uh, don't just drop it as a channel. Don't just view it as, oh, we did that during desperate times because it has huge long-term upside potential. Virtual experiences, which we call VX, uh, that includes virtual tastings, virtual events, comes in three categories. We have our, our private virtual experiences, one screen to one screen, or private small groups one screen to a group of people who know each other on many screens. Um, that is changing the way that we're relating, not just with our club members, but also meeting lots of new club members. That's one category. The second category are corporate uh, virtual experiences, which I know are exploding. And um, the third are, is the virtual version of the events. Why is what, as many of you know, uh, WISE um, has done mystery shopping for um, tasting rooms for years. So Pre-COVID, we've done 5,000 mystery shops in the, in the previous two years. We now are doing a lot of virtual experience mystery shopping, and there's really good experiences, and there's not so good experiences. And so we are spending a lot of our time, content, and curriculum development in launching four new classes um, that specifically address the virtual space because we believe it is, it is here to stay. And I think just to underline it one more time, as we can turn many of those virtual experience programming in ways to meet new customers and therefore have new club member signups, that will change the direct-to-consumer, um, basically upside potential forever for the industry. So. I could go on and on, but that's some wise bites. Here's a great question that we got um, that ties into that, Leslie. Um, so we asked, uh, will digital efforts be able to sustain a growing winery saturation effort in 2021, or is it success related more to 2020 and the efforts of wineries, right? So as more wineries are pounding the pavement in these digital channels, how is that looking with, uh, in regards to the marketplace and kind of the longevity and sustainability? So here's what we've seen so far. The explosive growth of and a lot of wineries at the four or 500% zone, depending on how small your base was to start with back in March and April and May, it's calmed down a bit, but it is still really significant. And I think that if you look at, at what's been happening with um, digital growth, kind of beyond the most egregious part of shelter in place, um, not uh, lower, kind of headed back there in many regions now, I know. And so, so we think that there is a long, what we're thinking, are very confident that there's a long-term expanded base. Again, think of your own consumer buying practices and, you know, I'm never gonna go back to shop how I shopped before again. So it's there, might not be as um, insane as the second quarter in the calendar year 2020, but still, very significant. And to, to <laughs> that data, Leslie, that's exactly right. So when you look at basically uh, the year over year digital growth in those early COVID months, the average was in the 100, 120 percentages. 
Whereas if you look at back to those last four months that I was uh, looking at um, before, it's more in the 50 to 60% range. I'm going to uh, potentially go through a slide that didn't make it into here to show you that. But um, let's see here, going off script here, guys. Okay, here you go. Sorry, not a, not a perfectly polished slide, but this is what I'm talking about. You can see the heavy digital growth in, in these crazy months. And then you can see that the digital growth is a little bit less in these months. And I would say part of that is just due that, uh, you know, to Leslie's point of customizing clubs, you know, um, uh, basically, you know, we've noticed that a lot more digital activity happens in club shipment months. And so that's a very standard you know, uh, revenue category that happens. But anyway, um, Grant, great question. And hopefully this, this data gives you a little bit more of a peek into the, the growth as we've seen it thus far. So there's a uh, great question that just came up in chat. Any ideas of how to attract virtual customers, especially corporate? Yes, <laughs> a number of ideas. First of all, uh, we just did this survey out of 100 wineries that we know are actually doing really well with virtual experiences with VX, less than 30% of them had any appropriate mention, any mention on their website at all, and less than 10% of them had any, you know, did it well. And so, first of all, think of virtual as just as important as your tasting room. It deserves its own tab. How does it work? You know, invite people in. And so, let's nail that. Second is especially corporate. If you have a list of people who you've done corporate gifts or volume gifts for in the past, reach out specifically. Um, and it's not just it's not just people who've done corporate gifting with you. If you look through your club member database and see what companies they work at, if you can tell, there are a lot. I mean, almost across the board, corporations are not spending their travel and entertainment budgets. Obviously they can't, and they wanna do things for their uh, clients. They wanna do things for their team members. And this is a fabulous solution to a problem that they have and dollars burning a hole in their pocket. And so be proactive and, and reach out. And then the third lever to pull, which could lead to privates or it could lead to corporates are on the, um, club members themselves, extend uh, virtual tastings as a club member benefit, encourage them to be bringing extended family and friends as that's that um, domino effect to meet new customers. One thing that, uh, that we've seen in the, uh, in the research that we've done in getting ready to launch the classes, which we you now have just done, is we call it the ripple effect. So most both private and corporate tastings if you plant the seed at the end of that virtual experience saying, hey, we'd love to host you again, perhaps with you know, another group, another team, that the majority of those virtual tastings, if you ask for it, end up in more virtual tastings. There is leverage here like, like we've never seen before. And um, some wineries are not experiencing it. And in my experience, it's because they're not, is because they are not asking. Yeah, Leslie, you just you just hit on we you said leverage and a bunch of your comments. I think about scalability. I mean, the digital plus, uh, doing virtual tastings, working more towards um, uh, focusing more on corporate. Those things that are those things are scalable uh, for business owners who don't have a lot of free time and may have restrictions. You know, even when we get past COVID, they may, they may still have restrictions on how many visitors they can get to the tasting room, but, but virtual is almost infinitely scalable. Um, if you, if you have a plan and have, you know, the people trained to, to work on it. So, um, so that was fantastic. Um, John and, and Leslie and Nick, thank you. Um, We've got just a, a few minutes left uh, before we wrap up. Uh, we're almost. I've got a couple. Over. I've got a couple of good questions that came up. Yeah. Uh, so there's two. One from Grant and one from Jeff uh, Zappelli at Walt. And basically, so uh, Grant's question, just to piggyback on the digital, that I we don't community benchmark doesn't yet have data on this. But his question was, hey. 
is the uptick in digital more a, a an effect of a level of effort on the winery's behalf, or is it more on changing buying habits of the consumers? And I know Leslie, you have an opinion on this. Uh, some wineries have woken up to that really weren't doing digital at all and are giving an effort, but most wineries, at least most wineries we work with have been focused on it for a long time. So I believe it's the change in the consumer habit and I believe it's here to stay. Great. And then Jeff was asking about a great question, Jeff. He was asking about visitation. Uh, basically his question is, Hey, uh, since web, since club member acquisition on the web, isn't really meeting our prior business model uh, with the tasting room situation. And since we have an abundance of inventory planned for those avenues of revenue, are there any ideas surrounding building that traffic? And so I'll just kick this off with a little data perspective that I, that I mentioned, and then any, anyone else feel free to join in. But, you know, as I mentioned, actually, let's, let's hop, let's maybe hop back um, to the visitation slide. Where was that? Oh, here it was. So um, as I mentioned, so I would say number one, uh, local traffic is definitely where it's at. If you look at, again, so Amador County, uh, Central Coast, even up here in Mendocino, those wineries, um, like I said, their visitation is darn near back to 2019 levels in October. And um, if you look at uh, basically the central coast down in Paso, et cetera. You know, we've got a lot of folks driving up from LA, but maybe we should interview them and figure out a little bit more what's going on there. Um, over in, in, in Amador County uh, and up here in Mendocino, you know, you, you've got a, a really high percentage of visitation that are already club members already. So, um, and then I think Napa and Sonoma, my thinking is just, hey, um, you know, we, we have a big, nut to fill from last year with all the people that were getting on planes, et cetera. And so, you know, what do we do? And I think that's really kind of what Jeff is asking if there's any good ideas that have, that have come up or anyone wants to share. Right. So it really depends. Some wineries have already done a great job on outreach for digital and some were asleep at the wheel at it. So if you're sleepy, please, <laughs> please wake up and focus on it. Sure, of course, there's gonna be upside. And I, um, and, but I truly think that we are only seeing back to the virtual experiences that that can be a leverage point that we have no idea how big it can be. And it, like most wineries are almost choking on the volume of it. And it's like, what if we were trying? <laughs> so uh, is virtual <laughs> a good club acquisition channel, Leslie? Yes, it is. It can be um, for wineries that are figuring out how to crack that code. And it, it takes some choreography of the guest experience. It certainly takes training to build up the build up the skills and the confidence of a broader base of team members. If you have your virtual tasting stuck on the amount of hours that the winemaker or the owner can give to it, we're not thinking through it correctly. We need to think through it the same way we go, we go through um, from the tasting room side and train up others. And you offer trainings on that, right? We do. We do. Yeah, we have four certification classes, one of which is launched and the other three launch in January and February. Cool. Well, uh, Mark, take us yeah. home, but thank you everyone. Yeah, it looks like uh, on our final poll, uh, about two thirds of, of the audience uh, would love to see uh, similar content to this on a quarterly basis. So um, sounds like uh, it, most folks found this valuable and so uh, maybe early in uh, 2021, we can uh, reconvene and uh, John and Nick will have some great new data to, uh, to share with us. Um, Leslie and John, because uh, we're running over a little bit, but uh, do you guys just briefly want to um, let the audience know sort of how they can engage with you if they want to learn more about, um, you know, how you work with wineries and because um, uh, we'd love to have obviously uh, a more robust data set uh, when we get get together next time and uh, would love uh, to get uh, Oregon and, and Washington and some of the other regions outside of Napa and Sonoma uh, more involved in, uh, in working with uh, community benchmarks so we've got um, a, a greater data set. But uh, we'll just kind of close with, um, I'll thank everybody for, for joining us and John and Leslie, anything uh, you guys want to add? 
Sure. I One thing that uh, in our WISE classes, all of which are now virtual, similar to you, we, we had to learn a whole new business model, uh, which we have done successfully, is during this season of COVID, we have definitely had offers out saying, don't, you know, we're here to support the industry. Don't let lack of budget hold you back. If you or your team members want or need to take a WISE class and can't afford it, just reach out to us and be our guest. I and mean, we have done, to give you a sense, in the 2019, we served 340 um, wine industry professionals and leaders. And this year we've been able to help over 3,000. It is our absolute privilege and please just reach out. We wanna help. Awesome. And John? Great. Well, thank you everyone for being here. This was a lot of fun for us. Um, the link is up on the screen if you want to follow that. Um, you can get in touch with myself or Nick. Um, as Leslie said, you know, we have an option where we can review your metrics compared to your peers as well. Um, so, you know, follow the link and, and find out more there or just go ahead and, and contact us and uh, looking forward to the next one. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, we'll send out the uh, the slide deck and um, and also a, a recording uh, so that uh, uh, you can forward it to your friends who may not have had a chance to to tune in today. But we thank everybody for uh, for joining us. Have a wonderful holiday season, and hopefully we'll uh, see you again soon in uh, early 2001, 21. Thanks. <laughs>